2 Corinthians this morning, chapter number 8. I love the book of 2 Corinthians. I find it an amazing thing. It's the only church that the Apostle Paul told that he loved. He said, my love be with you, Lord. And I, I like that. He had a lot of problems with that Corinthian church. Uh, they start out real bad. You know, you go to 1 Corinthians, there's 15 chapters of rebuke. Boy, isn't that bad when all God's got to say to you is rebuke. I'll never forget an old preacher one time preaching on the book of Jonah, and he preached on the last word of the book of Jonah, the word is cattle. And he said, it's a shame when the last thing God had to say to a prophet was cattle. He said, I don't want to offend his help with God having to say cattle. Get 2 Corinthians, you find very little rebuke. They got a lot of things right. The only thing that they didn't get right was receiving the man back in chapter 5. Uh, they had put out of the church for fornication. They got right with God. He's having a hard time getting reconciled within the church. Uh, God forgot that the church didn't, and he put them straight on that. You get chapter number 8, very interesting chapter. As our new year comes in, uh, boy, I preached last Sunday on the water finish right. Personal decision. I hope you've made a personal decision that you're going to live for Christ. You young people live for God. Family buried a 19-year-old this week. I saw the pictures that they gave, little thing, just this innocent little child, and when that child got into his mid-teens, you could see his eyes and his face had changed. I saw the rebellion in that young man that led ultimately to his death. Boy, what a, what a horrible thing. Listen, you young people, you want to start right, you want to finish right. But you let this world get you out of the will of God, and it will. It will defile you. It will destroy your life. The devil is seeking whom he may devour, and he is certainly devouring young people. So what I want to look at this morning is I want our church to finish right. I want our church to do right. We find a couple of examples, verses uh, 1 <coughs> Through five, we, we find the example of the churches at Macedonia. Let's read those very quickly. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy. You know, they were happy despite their circumstances. They were happy despite their circumstances. I like what Paul told Agrippa over in the book of Acts. He said, O king, I think myself happy. You know you think yourself happy. It doesn't matter what you're surrounding. The joy of the Lord is strength me by 810. I believe we have to think ourselves happy. I just, I want to be happy. I'd rather laugh than cry. I'd rather serve than sit. Hey, if I, boy, I tell you what, I just want to live a good life a full life and thank God for it. So writing to them and in their deep affliction, that's, is that not what he said? A great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy. Look at the second thing. In their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. The poor they got, the more they gave. What is giving? Giving. Giving is a grace that God gives. As a matter of fact, the last verse in chapter number 8 it says, thanks, well, where am I at here, amen? Uh, anyway, we're, we're not going to go there. But anyway, I just want you to understand the grace of God that he gave. Notice verse number three, for to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. Their power is what they have. Beyond their power was their faith to give above. When he said, praying us, with much entreaty that we would receive the gift. Now, what's he talking about? He's talking about the gift that was going to the churches in Jerusalem. He dealt with that First chap uh, uh, Corinthians chapter 16. But he's talking about a church, a church that had a hard time, and they prayed for the missionary to take the money. I like that. I don't know many people come up and beg a missionary, would you please take my money? You know, they go around trying to uh, get support and living off of what they get. But I, I thank God some people just go up and you don't have to say a word. They just hand them 
Hand them some money. Put it in their hand. And say, I, I want you to take this. I want you to use this. And thank God for it. But he said, and take on us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hold. What was the key? Look at the last part of verse number five. This was the Macedonian churches. He said in verse five, but first gave their own selves to the Lord. What is the key to living for God? You've got to give yourself to God. You give all that you have to God. Everything comes from God, right? Every good gift and every perfect gift coming down from the Father's lights. It's James chapter 1 and uh, verse number 17. So we find that this church in their affliction, in their poverty, they abounded in joy and liberality. So he gives that illustration of a church that despite their circumstances, they carried on the work of God without fail. The second thing he says, he said in verse number seven, therefore as you abound in everything in faith, utterance, knowledge, and in all diligence, and if you love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. So he goes down and then he talks about their giving, the sincerity of their love. Boy, what a blessing that this church was obedient to God. And he's talking to the Corinthian church. He wants them to be the same. The second example is found in verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the grace of the Macedonian church was giving. What was the grace of Jesus Christ? It was giving. He gave. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his life. So we find the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is a second example that though he was rich, can you imagine what he had in heaven? I cannot imagine what heaven's going to be like. But our Lord left heaven's glory. Anything, everything, listen, it is the utopia of the universe. This is where God resides. This is where everything is all about. He gave up heaven. Notice what it said in verse number 9. Though he were rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. Born in a stable, not even a place to lay his head. They put him in a manger that night. He was born into poverty. He was born into a carpenter's home in a small town called Nazareth. And there he resided. He worked hard. When I think of Jesus Christ, I don't think of this uh, effeminate looking uh, fellow with long hair that they show. And I, let me tell you, he was a rugged man. His hands were calloused, his muscles were sinewy. This man was a man who worked hard all of his life. We find hard work through the Bible never hurt anybody. So we find he was a working man. But what happened, he gave up heaven and he became, the Bible said, poor. That though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. What, what's his life all about? Life is about others. It's not about, a, if you get hung up on this, me and my more, me and my four no more business, you're going to live a bad life. Let me tell you, it's all about, some people say, well, my life is my business. My life is your business. Your life is my business. Everybody's life is everybody's business. We affect people all around us every day. And the decisions we make and what we do, I said when this started, I wasn't going to let COVID-19 affect me that much, but it's affected our life on every side. There's no way to get away from that. I mean, this is closed, that's closed, and you got this rule, you got that rule, you got people sick, you got things all around. It affects our life. Our life affects others. I'm talking about the church. We found in the Macedonian church our predicament led to their power, and through their prayer, they prospered. Boy, how God blessed them. How, how God blessed the Lord Jesus Christ. One of these days, he's going to present to himself the church, not having spot or wrinkle nor any such thing. He's going to present this thing to himself. And boy, what a blessing. Now, what I want to deal with is the church. Verse number 10 and 11, I want to look at something. Herein I give my advice. Now, I'm going to give you some advice. One, 2020 is gone. 
history. You can't change it. Or let me tell you, you can't change it. You can't do anything about it. 2021 has just started. This is day three. You had New Year's Day on Friday. You had the second on Saturday, the third on Sunday. We're just getting started this thing. So what I've done is, along with my reading, I, I'm reading where I read, but I'm also trying to keep up with this calendar. If you want one of these down here, uh, then I, I've already got two days ahead of the calendar. I just... I have a hard time fitting in that, but what I want to do is make sure that I kind of see where you're reading, when you're reading, and know what you're doing. If you're reading through according to that, that way I know what to preach on. <clears throat> but our church, I want a church to finish right. Last year's gone. This is a new church. I look around, and everything is, as they would say today, going south. Change and decay and all around, I see, folks, America is decaying. It's going downhill. You young people never know the America we grew up in. You have no concept. You have no idea of what it was like to be raised in the 40s and the 50s and the early 60s. You have no concept. I, I hate that, that you have missed what we had. But at the same time, things are going to decay. Before the, hey, the Bible said that things will wax worse and worse. People say, well, it's going to get better. Don't worry about it, preacher. Not according to the Bible. And from what I see, the Bible's right. There's a moving downhill. Now, let's bring that to the church. And churches in general, most of them have gone liberal. By liberal, we have different degrees of liberality. Some of them are extremely out in the left field. Then you've got others, not quite so much. And you got others, and you see a decay in the churches. All around I see, in churches everywhere. Now, these people are not bad people. I want you to understand they're people just like you. Matter of fact, we have the same wicked, deceitful heart that they've got. I believe that our heart, our nature, is desperately wicked. The Bible talks about the heart, deceitful above, above all things and desperately wicked, and who can know it? Paul said, in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Now, if you think there's anything good in your flesh, you're going to get you're going to get a real surprise, all right? You have to control that flesh. That's what it's all about. So liberalism is something that you and I can fall into the very same thing. I call it getting used to the dark. Just kind of letting down here and slipping over here and letting down a little bit over here. And one man told me years ago, said, Preacher, if you just let up in the pulpit, we'd have more people. We would have had more people. A lot of people do not want the preaching of the Word of God. It's not my preaching. My preaching is not hard. Mine is just simply biblically straight. I preach the Word of God as it is to people as they are, and then they can deal with it. And it's between them and God what they do with it. But we find where they are today, we may be tomorrow. I want you to think about that. We may be tomorrow. I don't want to finish wrong, and I don't want our church to end up finishing wrong. That's why well, I try to maintain who's in and out of this pulpit. I try to maintain things. I try to oversee the church in a biblical manner to try to take the temperature of the church and see what's going on within the church itself because slippage is something that takes place so suddenly. You know, when you begin to drift, it's kind of like these young people that like to get out in the waves at the ocean. They face out at the ocean and the big old swells come in. You ever go up and down with us? Isn't that fun? We used to call them carry-alls. You know why? They carry you all the way down the beach. You look up 15 minutes later and where, where your parents or whoever sitting back up here, you're down the other direction from them because you went very slowly with that wave. It's just gently moving you on down the road, and that's the way it is spiritually. Now, where these churches are today, and not every church is a bad church, but I find they all tend to decay when they're left on their own. 
without the parameters of the Word of God. What are the, what are the parameters of the Word of God? I often say they're like these pews. These ends of these pews define a path to that door. They keep you walking straight. I don't see anybody walks in and out of every pew to get to the back door or the front door or whatever. Our back door is our front door, and our front door is our back door. So uh, the front door is the back of the church, and this is the front of the church, which is the back of the church, and that's about confusing. But when you come in, that's the way most churches are set up. That way you don't walk into the choir. So it's that way for us. No, we don't walk in out of the pews to get to where we're going. What we do, we take the straightest path. What is the shortest point? It's a line between two points. We talk about it as the crow flies. You know, it takes you three full hours to get to Charleston, South Carolina. Three full hours. But if you got in an airplane and flew straight to there, I'm not talking about speed. I'm talking about distance. You would take out every curve in the road. You would take out every hill. You take out every valley. You take it out. It does not take that long to get from here to Charleston if you go as the crow flies. These parameters, the Word of God is to get us from point A, where you got saved, to that straight, narrow gate A, to get you to point B as straight as possible. That's what the Word of God's for. Now, when the church is left to its own, what happens is the church begins to drift. We find a lot of drifting in churches. I don't believe you are going to become apostate. I believe apostasy is something for the lost. It's something for the unsaved. I do not believe that God's people can apostatize. And the Bible uses that word. It talks about a falling of the way first over in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. And that falling away is a deception of the end time. So you find falling away or standing away from a former position and people are moving. But I don't want a church to do that. Now, I don't like New Year's resolutions. So what I'm going to do is take verses 10 and 11, and I'm going to look at Paul's advice to a church. Why? Wow. They had problems in 1 Corinthians. They kind of got rid of them in 2 Corinthians, but now he's advising them about something. Notice in verse number 10, for this is expedient for you. I want to look at that word expedient just for a moment. What does that mean? The best case scenario. Our Lord, when he went away, he said, it's expedient that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come. They were worried about Jesus Christ leaving them and going back to heaven and leaving those disciples alone. And the Lord said, the best thing that will ever happen to you is when I go back and sit at the right hand of the Father and the comforter, the Spirit of God, will come. So he's giving advice, and he said, it is expedient for you who have begun, that's their past, not only to do, that's their present, but also to be forward, that means they're looking down the road. Now, I'm going to look at those three things this morning. What keeps a church on track? I believe this verse keeps a church on track. What? I thought about our illustrious Christ. Listen. This church has done well. I mean, our, hey, our past. Great past. Thank God for it. This last year and the year of COVID, our church prospered. Not just financially, but our church actually prospered. Where a lot of churches have not prospered this last year, Temple Baptist Church prospered. It prospered spiritually. It prospered physically. It prospered financially. It continued to prosper this morning. God has blessed this church. So as we look back, listen, God's been good. This church has always been a mission-hearted church. This church has always been a giving church. This church has the sweetest fellowship that I've ever seen in a church. I mean, listen, we're all different, right? I hope nobody's mad at anybody this morning. I don't think they are. That's why we shake hands so much. We shake hands because I want you to. Matter of fact, you keep shaking hands. I sit down until you get done. I don't interrupt you. I'm talking about our past. Boy, thank God. Hey, 
We, we, our church has done well. It's still an old-fashioned, fundamental Baptist church that stays with the old paths of the Scriptures. Amen. Amen. You know why a lot of people are mad at your preacher all the time outside? For one reason, that I just simply believe that this is the Word of God and it's right. Amen. Amen. Why would they ever persecute or get mad at a man because he stood on the Bible? Makes no earthly sense, does it? The number one problem, oh, you're one of those. Yeah, I simply am. I believe the Bible is right. I believe it's every word right. I believe it's the word of God. It's not up for debate. We don't debate it. We don't render it. We just simply preach it and teach it and try to live by it. And if we do that, we do right well. So, in our past, we've always been that way. Despite everything. But we find a resolving in the present. Now, notice what he's doing. Like all churches, he said you, you, you were right back there. He said you began back there. You did right. I go back to our beginning. We had seven people and my four made 11. We were talking about that the other night and I still want to get a hold on Brother Terry. I'm going to make a telephone call and try to run him down. Most of you don't know Terry Morris. Terry Morris is the man that God used to put me at Temple Baptist Church 33 and a half years ago. That was Brother Terry Morris that did that. I thank, I thank God for that man. Good, good man. He got me down here, and I, I praise the Lord for that. But listen, we, we started with few, but that few loved God. That few stayed with God. They served God. They lived for God. They started supporting missionary. They loved the Word of God. They still love the Word of God. They began right. We began right. You know, sometimes God's got to let something die before he resurrects it. Sometimes a generation has to pass away or off the scene before God can do anything. Sometimes it has to be that way. You never want people to go, but sometimes they have to in order for the church to prosper. It cannot prosper in the condition that it's in at that time. This church has survived a lot. Started about two or three years after we came here and we started having some people that would come in and they were causing issues and an undercurrent in the church and God just moved them out, moved them out, moved them out to where we are here. This is, we began right and we have done right. I believe the church is right this morning. Amen. I believe it's right. Now, are we perfect this morning? Absolutely not. We're not a perfect church. If you're looking for a perfect church, don't join it. You'll mess it up. None doeth good. You understand there was one perfect one and they crucified him because he was perfect. Pilate said, I find in him no fault at all. Judas said, I betrayed the innocent blood. One of the centurions standing at the bottom of that cross said, truly this man was the son of God. They knew who he was. They hated him because of what he was. Boy, you won't find a perfect church. We talked to a young lady last night uh, down here at the clock restaurant and invited her to a good church. Invited her here last night and I talked to her a while. Brother Dave Roth talked to her a while and I gave her a track and he gave her a track. She said, I've got all kinds of tracks. We said, well, we'll make sure you got another one. And she had another one up at the counter up there at the cash register. I think she'd already gotten that one. So now she's got three tracks of us and we're not leaving the table yet. This is, we're inviting her to a good church. Good church. I tell people, you want a good church, you come to Temple Baptist Church, you want a perfect church, then you need to go someplace else. But listen, I believe we've got a church this morning that has a heart to do right. Amen. I believe you've got a heart to do right. I don't always do right as a pastor, but I've got a heart to do right. I've got a want to. I've got a desire. Boy, I, I told Brother Roth, I want this year to be the best year that I have ever had in the ministry. The best year I've ever had at Temple Baptist Church. Listen, I don't care about age. I'm not into that. I, I'm not getting older. I'm just looking older. Amen. I guess that comes along with the weather in South Carolina. But at the same time, listen, I'm, I'm excited about living for this year. I'm excited. I told Brother Raw, I am excited about 2021. 
I want to be a good year. We've got a good past, and we've got a good present. So what we want to do, we use that word forward in verse number 10. He said not only you began right, but now not only to do right, but also to be forward a year ago. He said when you started right a year ago, you were planning for down the road. I don't know what 2021 is going to hold. Thank God I don't know what it's going to hold. We'll take it one day at a time, dear Jesus. That's all I'm asking of you. Listen, that's all you've got. Somebody said, how's a perfect way to live? Preacher, you ought to live as if Jesus Christ would come today and you ought to plan as if he would never come. That keeps your perspective right down the road, forward. Now, what I want to do is deal with that forward just for a few moments this morning. What's it going to take? I believe that, one, it's going to take a realization that we're just like everybody else. We can fail. We can fall flat on our face. Listen, it's up to you. This is your church. It belongs to you. It belongs to God. It belongs to you. And God's just putting me around here to kind of make sure things about halfway stay straight at times. And then you've got to try to keep me straight in the meantime. But listen, it's all about you. This is your church. What do you want for your kids? What do you want for your children? Boy, I find parents today are so tied up in this world that they don't have any time for the church in their kids' life. What do you want for your kids? What do you want for your family? What do you want for your friend? I want, hey, I want a church that I can go to Sunday morning and Sunday night, and Wednesday night, and revival nights, and every other night. I want a church where I can go. One day I may not be able to pastor anymore. I still plan on being faithful to church. Barbara may have to help me in, or I may have to help her in, or you may have to help both of us in. We'll put a wheel, we'll, we'll put a wheelchair ramp all the way up to the seat. That way you can slide us up and set us down. Hey, I'm talking about forward. Now, we're in the beginning of this thing. What's it going to take? I think it's going to take one thing. One, it's going to take a reliance. A realization that we can be like everybody else. If that's the trend that we set, then we'll be like everybody else. I don't want to be like everybody else. I'm not saying they're all bad. I'm not saying they're all good. I, hey, they're none of my business this morning. I have one church business in mind, and that's Temple Baptist Church. Amen. This is my business. I want you to understand. this. Uh, people are, I had somebody one time call and say, you know what's going on in a certain big church up in Greenville? They were out in Oregon. I said, no, I don't know. They said, well, we've heard we're out in Oregon. You're 50 miles away. I said, I'm not listening. It's none of my business. I thank God for them. I pray for these pastors. I pray for pastors up there. I pray for pastors in our county. I pray for these churches. I want them to flourish. I want them to do right. But when you get down to what, hey, where the rubber meets the road, it's what are we going to do with it this year? This is our church. God gave it to us. You say, what's it going to take? It's going to take three things. One, it's going to take the grace of God. Boy, one thing I found out about the grace of God, and I sent out of 2 Corinthians uh, some verses over to a family this morning. Uh, they shared that video with me, and I sent them the God of all comfort. Boy, what a blessing. But with it, he comforts our hearts, and then we comfort those that are in any other problem with the comfort through which we've been comforted. That's just simply paraphrasing the verses. It's going to take the grace of God. What's the grace of God? The grace of God is a sufficient grace. It'll get you through anything, anytime in your life. You know, the Bible talks about you can fail of the grace of God. If any man fail of the grace of God, what's that mean? It means the grace is there. The grace didn't fail. You failed to receive the grace. I've seen people that just will not receive the grace that they need. They, it's there, but they're just not going to take it. And, and what happens is they usually end up out and bitter. 
I don't want to get out and better. I want to get in and better. Um, I want this to be a good year. I'll be 70, what? Three, I'll be 73 this year. Isn't that a blessing? Amen. 73 years old. Some of my friends are already 73. Earl Green's already 73. Jimmy Clark's already 73. I'm the youngest of the crowd. But it's going to take the grace of God to get us through this year. I don't know. We may lose some folks. We may have some folks that go on to glory. We may, hey, we may have some sickness. We may have some problems slip into the church that we're going to have to handle. And if they do slip in the church, we will handle them. Mm -hmm. I am a wolf hunting machine. I have grown old enough in the pastor to know what they look like and what they sound like, and I know how to watch them. And don't you think you say, well, does preacher know what's, who's coming in and who's out? I know everybody that comes in and goes out. That's my responsibility as an overseer of the church, as a shepherd. David killed a lion and he killed a bear. He killed these things because he came to take a lamb out of his flock. I'm a wolf hunter. But it's going to take the grace of God. Listen, if you get in trouble, don't you quit. If I get in trouble, you hold me up. That's what we're here for, to hold one another up. To lift each other up. When you see somebody falling down, hey, don't, don't feel bad to pick up a telephone and call them. Tell them, hey, I love you and I'm praying for you. Is there anything I can do to help you? You don't have to butt into their business. You just got to be there for them. Sometimes when people grieve, you just got to be there. That's right. When I found out about the Congress problem, the first thing I did was call. It'd be easy to text, wouldn't it? Oh, we're praying for you and we're sorry for your loss. I picked up that call and spent an hour and 11 minutes on that telephone. I listened to them and they listened to me and I prayed with them. Hey, I, hey, you just got to be there. You've got to be there for each other. It's going to take the grace of God for all of us to be together. And at the end of the year, I want as good or a better church next year as we've got this year. Amen. It's important. The grace of God. And then the second thing is we've got to remember that it's all for God, so it's to God's glory. What are we here for? To build ourselves up? Somebody referred to me as trying to be a Baptist Pope. You know why? Because we never shut down Sunday school, Sunday morning, or Sunday night. This is an independent Baptist preacher. I'm not even going to throw his name out there because some of you might know him. He doesn't live in this state. But he called, he said, I was trying to be a Baptist pope. His church is his business. I am a local church man. Do you understand? The local church is autonomous. It's to be indigenous. It's to be self-running, self-governing under the word of God. Hey, that's what this thing's all about. We're not here because of somebody else. We're here for God's glory this morning. I want God to be glorified this morning. And it's hard to glorify God when you're imperfect. But you know what? God accepts us. Isn't that a blessing? I thank God this morning that God doesn't take a two before and knock me in the head every time I get out of the will of God. I still love what Brother Brent Grove said sitting back there in the back about a year or two ago. He stood up and he gave a little testimony and he said, I thank God that God goes out of his way to protect our testimonies. God does that. Boy, the goodness of God. Why? Right. This thing is for God's glory. It's not for us. If we do this because we're old-fashioned, if we do this because we're old paths, if we do this because of what we give to mission, if we do this because of that, then it becomes self. Right. We're not here this morning to glory in self. We're here to glory in God. Bible said the glory in the Lord, the glory in God. This is done for him. This church belongs to God. This ground is his. This building's his. That's why I tell people, don't mistreat it. Mm. Right. I 
come through and I pick up trash sometime and I think, why in the world do people walk out and leave their pew in the shape they leave it in? Friend, when I had my family sitting on a pew in Kentucky, when we got up, I had policed that area. The song books were straight. There was no paper. There was nothing anywhere. You would not have known we sat there. Now, I'm just going to say that this is God's house. Amen. We're going to treat it like God's house. We're going to worship here like it's God's house to where God can feel welcome to the worship services. God's grace and God's glory. The third thing is, and I'm going to bring it back, it's going to be for our good. Our good. I have watched the church fall to pieces. The church of Auburn and I got saved in. I've seen a thousand to fourteen hundred people sitting on those pews. Had a sixteen hundred seat auditorium out there. Boy, I, that thing was huge. I, hey, when we finally inherited that thing, there was 83 of us sitting on a 1600 seat auditorium. Hey, you talking about social distancing, you didn't even have to see each other, much less talk. Mm -hmm. I remember my pastor preaching one time and I would go upstairs. That thing was set up for television. It was set up for radio. It was set up for everything. It, you should have seen those mixer boards up in the top of that thing. So I ran sound, but I didn't want to sit up there. You know, you can sit over here and get some backslid. The FBI can't find you because you're watching everything. You're looking. So but I do get everything set up. I go down and sit with my wife up front and make sure everything, and I heard a whistling in a service. It sounded just like feedback on that big system. It just kept whistling and whistling and whistling. So finally I slipped out and went upstairs. I started moving, shifting stuff, and the, the whistling wouldn't stop. Mm. Just kept on and on whistling and whistling. And finally, I just cut the system off. And what, boy, when you cut that preacher off in that auditorium, he went, <clears throat> The whistling was still there, and I flipped it back on. An old lady's hearing aid. <laughs> she was trying to hear him the best she could, and the closer at hand got to that ear. And here she was, and she was just a whistling. I know what it is to see churches, good churches, churches where people were being saved. Churches begin to decay and fall and tumble and watch people get discouraged and start leaving those churches and going someplace else because of what's going on. This church this year is for our good. Amen. I want to feel good about coming to church. You want to dance? Go to a dance. You want hip hop, then you put your little iPod thing in your ear. You know, everybody going up down like this. Well, I see them going down the road with these little old iPod things in their ears. They can't hear traffic, horns, or anything else. They're listening to that thing going down. This is, you want I hop? Hop, I hop. Yeah, I'll go there. <laughs> you come to God's house. You say, how do you worship? You worship doing what we're doing this morning. I thank God, old fashioned. You didn't have a whole lot of swinging from chandeliers a hundred years ago, and I'm not against people getting excited. Thank God for them. It, hey, I just don't, hey, hey, I can't even reach the chandeliers. I don't walk on the back of the pews because my balance won't let me. I don't scream and holler and shout because the people in front of me will get up and move to the back. I'm not against that. If that's the way you worship, folks. But I want to tell you where worship is found. Worship is found when you sing as unto the Lord, where you give as unto the Lord, where you preach as unto the Lord, and where you live as unto the Lord. It's for our good that we've got some place to come where they don't fight. You don't hear anybody say anything. Listen, hey, our conversations about the Lord, we just enjoy ourselves. When they leave here, they go out to the parking lot and hang out there. That's okay. Just don't get behind my car. <laughs> Thank God for backup cameras. How many got a backup camera? I love it. You know why? The first time we pulled in Mike and Kim's driveway, 
I put that thing in reverse and looked at that thing and watched one of our grandchildren walking right behind the bar. Mm. And I couldn't even see. I told my wife, I said, that just made the car a whole lot better. I've got a backup camera now. Now I can see back behind me. I see so good, I backed into a tree. <laughs> Did you know they make your bumpers on some of these cars out of rubber? Now you may think that sounds bad. We went in that thing, the whole back end crushed in. The guy took a little piece of trim off, reached in there and pushed it back out, put the trim on and said, you're welcome. I thought it was $1,000 worth of damage, then that rubber popped right back out of you. Hey, thank God, now it hit the tree again and don't have to worry about it. <laughs> this year, we had a good beginning, folks. I thank God we began with a small congregation because that allowed a young pastor to grow with them. I grew up with these people. I grew up with Harold and Joe and Miss Marty. Kept me straight. Amen. They'd come in, they'd look at me bug-eyed, I'd look at them bug-eyed, we just had a good time. We did good last year, thank God for that. But we've got a brand new year now. It's not about resolution, but it is about resolving. I, you say, what's the difference? New Year's resolutions don't even last through New Year's Eve. I'm going to lose 50 pounds this year and then eat everything in the house over Christmas and the holidays. <laughs> Anybody here? Good? You know what we do? Right? We're going to start a diet at our house. Now, we got candy, we got cakes, we got pies, we got everything. First thing Barbara said, we've got to eat everything so it's out of the house. I thought, is, is that not defeating the purpose of starting this? I mean, put it in the garbage, give it to the dog, do something else. We go through, we clean all the cabinets out, and then we go to Walmart to get three things and come back with a hundred dollars worth of groceries and guess what? Potato chips and cookies and candies and all this stuff right back in. I'm not into resolutions, but I believe that there needs to be a resolving. They've got to remember, they've got to realize, they've got to resolve, and then they've got to rely. If we don't rely on Christ this year, we'll fail. You see, he holds tomorrow. He holds this year in his hand. He knows the end from the beginning. He looks forward from the past, and he looks back from the future. He knows every step I take. Each step I take, my Savior goes before me. Let's have a good year this year. Keep a good church. Hey, you stay in here. If you've got a problem, don't you fall out. Don't you get out. You stay in there. This is your family. The people love you. Amen. You're not isolated. You just come and get in, and it'll be all right. You stay with them, and we'll have a good year this year. And maybe this is the year the Lord will come. Amen. Wouldn't that be a blessing? Yeah. How many want to go home? Oh, let me tell you something. The older you get, you young people, you're not thinking that way yet because you're young. But us older people have a longing this morning. I look forward to death. Or I look forward to the rapture and whichever comes first will be all right with me. I want to live as long as I can live for God. I want to go home as soon as he'll release me. Be eternally with the Lord. Let's have a good year. Let's stand this morning if you need to come and come. You've got to remember. You've got to resolve. You've got to realize. 